Um, so as Walker said, I'm, I'm in the PhD program at, uh, at UMass Amherst and um, I'm working on a dissertation in economic history. And this presentation is directly coming out of um, the third substantial chapter of my dissertation. Um, I'm presenting this for the first time really, so this is the first time presenting this work, and so I'm really looking forward to getting some, getting some nice feedback from you. I, I really look forward to talking to you. Not just during the presentation though, um, but actually afterwards. I'll be, I'll, I'll be here this evening and I'm glad to talk to you at any point about um, grad school or you know, if you want to talk about my own presentation, that'd be great too. But anything related to uh, research and economics and so on. So thank you very much for coming. Okay, so this is just an overview of what I'm going to present today. Hint, you're not going to see any economic models. Um, I do do some modeling in some of my other uh, research work, um, but my research today, the, the topic that I'm going to present to you today is more of a political economy, a classic political economy um, research project. And it was actually motivated not by a study of economics per se or economic theories. It was actually motivated by a lot of readings that I've been doing in legal history. So I've been kind of immersing myself in the last six months or so in the legal history of early America because I'm very interested in early America because it was a very transformative period in American history. Um, you know, roughly the period between 1800 and 1850. You know, a very, very rapid transformation from a largely agrarian society to an industri industrialized society, certainly by the end of the Civil War. Um, and so, I was really interested in the institutional details behind that rapid social transformation. And that's what really motivated me into this topic. So I'm going to talk a little bit about traditional narratives in legal history as well as political economy. And then um, talk to you about what exactly I'm going to add to these discussions. So what am I saying new? And then I'm going to move on to my research framework. So give you a presentation of my thesis, what I'm trying to argue, as well as my methodology. And what you'll notice that a lot of it is drawn from political economy methods, but also case law analysis. So, you know, it's kind of different for, for an economist to be doing this kind of work, but, you know, that's, that's what I felt is the best way of kind of understanding these um, issues is, is, is through a close case law analysis. So first I'll give a background, um, background analysis of the two states that I'm looking at, Vermont and Connecticut. I'm doing, as you'll see, kind of a comparative study. And then moving on to the case analysis, which is really the, no, it's, it's, it's one of the main substantial parts of the, of the presentation. I would say both this background analysis, what I'm doing here, and the case law analysis are really the meat of the, of the, of the new work, and then just finish up with my conclusion. Okay, so where am I starting off from? Well, when you look at kind of post-World War II legal history narratives that really struck the profession, not just in legal history, but also political economy more, more widely. So a work that was read by economists, historians, all types of social scientists. You have Morton J. Horowitz's Transformation of American Law, which came out in 1979. This book presented this thesis of an instrumentalism of American law. And again, I'm talking about the period between 1800 and 1850. Basically what Horowitz argued is that this is really a unique period, not only for social history in terms of the transformation, but also legal history. The judges that were involved in court cases between 1800 and 1850 were kind of a unique bunch because they saw themselves not just as kind of judges, you know, drawing on precedent, drawing on, you know, past cases and so on, but they were actually actively involved in using law as an instrument to change social policy. So it was really about using the law as an instrument for effecting real economic change. And that's, what the, that's, that's the thesis that Horwitz tries to argue, that these judges were really forward-looking, they were trying to use the law in this way, and that you know, this, their creativity, their modernity, their inventiveness is really what you know, brought forward really a, a great change in, in, in law. And Horowitz really argues that all judges did this, you know, except for maybe a few fringe judges that didn't re really matter too much. You know, aside from those few judges, this was pretty much something that all judges kind of did. Now, I have a lot of problems with Horowitz's thesis, and w one of them is, is this claim, this kind of blanket claim that all the judges were like this, that all the judges were looking towards modernity and so on. As we'll see, the story is much more complicated than that. You know, Horowitz was really trying to assert this thesis that, you know, like I said, was eventually read by a, a very wide range of social scientists. And so 
in doing that, he kind of had to you know, fit his argument in a certain way, or at least present it in a certain way, so that everyone could be able to read it. And I think that in the process of that, he kind of lost some of the details. But anyway, um, later on, Tomlins comes in. Christopher Tomlins writes a book, 1993, Law, Labor, and Ideology in the Early American Republic, essentially going after the same period. And what he argues is something a little differently. It's not really economics. It's not really judges using law as an instrument to affect economic change. It's that judges, kind of as a band or as a group together, um, were politically motivated. They wanted to establish themselves against anti-federalists. So these judges were federalists. They wanted a strong centralized state. They wanted, um, you know, they, they wanted really the federalist program. And so they were reacting to what they saw as a little more anarchic version of American democracy, um, which was um, propounded by the, the anti-federalists, who were a little more uh, open to um, you know, decentralized politics of law. And so what, 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 what Tomlins argues is that it's not the economic motives, it's these political motives that really drove all of the judges. Um, it, was really, it was really these political motives that, that, that is what uh, characterizes the judges as a class. But again, it's, it's all judges believed this. It was all judges who had these kind of political motives and not a lot of room for nuance. Well, that's really where I come in. And in order to give you some, some idea of the flavor in which uh, that I'm trying to come, um, or, or that I'm trying to um, present here, I have Peter Karsten's 1996 work, Heart versus Head. He presented this different model of judges, and he broke them up into actually two categories, heart and head. And he said that judges in the early American Republic, again, same period, 1800 to 1850s, they were really operating under two somewhat conflicting views or philosophies of society. On the one hand, you had the head or the rationality. And this was kind of the, you know, the, the logical processing view of judges, this idea that, yes, judges were just trying to kind of calculate and process through a lot of precedent. And you know, maybe they were inventive on some levels, but really their main motives were to stay, stay close to the common law, stay faithful to the common law, and just kind of reassert the principles of the common law. On the other hand, judges were also had this, had this heart within them that was characterized by a, a type of morality, uh, really influenced heavily by religion. Um, and so this was a competing kind of motivation underlying some of the judges' claims, where um, Carson uses this to argue that, say, for example, if you have a case that involves a worker and an employer, Carson would say that, well, you know, at times the judges heart overruled his head because the judge would rule in favor of the workers simply because he thought that the worker should have a um, you know the, the worker should have his fair due say or you know he should be treated fairly or you know some kind of notion of um, morality or, or some religious values that would seep into these decisions so for Karsten his model is a little more nuanced and it's and it's on this idea of morality versus rationality which I, I thought to be really important now the big point that you might but just be wondering is, okay, that's great, but what's so interesting about this? What is so interesting about adding nuance to, you know, this these sweeping um, narratives of Horowitz and Tomlins? What is so important with that? Well, Tomlins and Horowitz's thesis implies a trend toward an ideal type of law, an ideal type that's just kind of there. It's existing and it has kind of just unidimensional effects on society. You know, law's sole purpose is to kind of affirm modernity, kind of carry modernity through by, you know, inventing a new set of rules that's, that's you know, that's appropriate to ushering in, say, you know, free contract or, you know, ushering in the will theory of contract. That's judges, or the law's sole purpose is to usher in this new stage of law appropriate for American modernity. Whereas alternatively, the alternative story is that different ideologies had different effects and there's some push and some pull on the progress towards like modern law in America. And that specifically, there might be some other motives that kind of work with modern principles, maybe buttress them, maybe at times hold them back, 
that I'm going to call traditional motives. But there are other, basically there are some other trends that, that either slow down or come to support modern principles of, say, free contract. And so I think that's more interesting because it, it says that the story is a little more complicated and also that what we normally think of as modern society isn't completely new. That there are always elements of an older view of society inherent in, in even today. We still have elements of, of an older society. It's not all just modern. It's not all just you know, forward-looking and progressive and so on. But there's some traditional elements too. So I have this important quote. So this is Hulsebosch, uh, Hulsebosch from New York University of Law. He's writing uh, an essay in 2011 that's discussing Horwitz's impact on the legal profession. And he says, you know, an interesting question would be, you know, how would transformation one look um, or how would it differ if Professor Ritt Horwitz had written it in the spirit of transformation too? If we took the legal reasoning of judges in the early republic as seriously as Professor Horwitz took those of the old and new conservatives in the late 19th century, how would we characterize their decisions? The revision might not alter the outlines, although I suggest that it actually does alter the outlines of Horwitz's compelling argument, but it at least would complicate and hum humanize a judiciary that in Transformation la One largely remains unitary and nameless. And I really want to focus on, on this part here. Complicate and humanize. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm trying to look at these judges, complicate their views, humanize them, say something about them that, that just doesn't come through in, in Horwitz. Obviously, Horwitz has to mention names in his book when he's you know, pre presenting his thesis. He says, you know, well, Nathaniel Chipman said this. Uh, Justice Story said this, but they're just all kind of parroting the same theme in Horowitz. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing new that they're really saying. It's, it's, or there's nothing really different that they're saying. So not only this complicated and hum humanized, but um, this, yeah, this point up here about took the legal reasoning of judges as seriously as he did um, in, his, in his later book, Old and New Conservatives. So it's really, you know, and I'll explain this in the methodology, but it's, it's what I'm particularly trying to do here. So what is my thesis statement? Kind of already have a flavor of it. While judges were actively involved in reforming legal institutions along more centralized lines in the early republic, judges brought their own interpretive frameworks about the civic status of employees and about contract to the bench. Such frameworks sometimes varied significantly with significant impacts on the development of labor relations in, 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 in the country by, and, and, and in the formation of a unified employment law by the mid-19th century. So this is something that um, you won't, you'll see more implicit throughout the presentation, but it's this idea that, well, even though we did have some variation that I'm going to try to exploit, um, at least prior to 1850, I am kind of implying that there was kind of a modern consensus on what employment contract law looked like by the 1850s and 60s. But I, I don't really concentrate so much on that later period. Uh, I almost take that for given in, the, in this presentation, and I focus on the earlier period. So to it, local variations in the development of co employment contract law um, can be explained by relating those variations to different models of political economy. And that's going to uh, take us into my methodology. I focus on two different states. And I do a comparative framework. I compare these two states as method. Um, my methodology compares these two states um, across various dimensions of political economy, viewpoints of political economy. This requires a deep reading of um, political treatises, um, other writings that these judges did in these two states. It involves looking at the um, economic background of these two states, comparing and contrasting the economic backgrounds of these two states, doing a lot of that kind of background work. And then in the second part, it entails comparing the trajectories of contract law in those two states. So after I've done some background on the political economy viewpoints of the judges and so on, I'm, th I'm then going to move on to case analysis and say, OK, well, how does that impact the variation in the trajectory of labor law in these two states during this period. Again, during the period from 1800 to 1850. And then I call you know, the first one 
uh, in Vermont, from a Vermont political ec economic framework, and then Vermont law. And then in Connecticut, I, I do something similar um, by looking at the background political economy, but also um, Connecticut's unique role in the legal profession, very important judges in Connecticut, of course, and then compare those two. So before I jump in and start doing some of the data analysis, are there any questions about where I'm going with this or anything that I can clarify about the history or any of the, the, the legal details or anything? Yeah, Walker? Yeah. Did you? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Uh, nobody else in the back, right. no. Uh, tapping Reeve, uh, are you going to elaborate on the story of how he became an even more important influence on future generations of the American law by running that law school? Litchfield? The Litchfield Law School, right, which is the first American law school. I, I really, when I say that Connecticut plays an important role in the legal profession, yeah, I, I don't just mean Zephaniah Swift, who was seen as America's Blackstone, very important. But yes, I, I think that Tapping Reeve plays an important role, too, in terms of kind of defining the mainstream of, Connecticut, of, of law in the U.S. Right, right. One of the student pupils in that law school was John C. Calhoun, for example. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of famous, um, famous uh, lawyer, lawyers and, and future judges came out of that school. Um, yeah, because Harvard Law School was not established even until, I think, 1814 or 1815. So for a, at least 15, 20 years, um, this, was the, this was the only legal school in the U.S. Um, legal education, aside from that, and this is actually an important sociological point, legal education in the U.S., when it wasn't done through a school, it was done through a traditional apprenticeship system. So you need and you know and when i say it's an Im important sociological tool that's what i mean you you need some connections to you know a, a local lawyer a local judge who will take you under his wing you know you need maybe some uh, financial capital to invest in the the appropriate law books to study up and then get admitted to the bar even the the process of admitting to the bar is being admitted to the bar is an interesting sociological point because you know, obviously these the admitting to the bar admittance to the bar was controlled by the current legal profession and in England it's even I, I think more interesting because you have you know for uh, do you know about the process at Middle Temple for example I, I, I heard about this you know at Middle Temple all you have to do is attend a certain number of dinners um, put on by the judge and once you've attended the certain number of dinners well then you're admitted to the bar and so on uh, actually a lot of Pennsylvania jurists in the late 1700s and early 1800s were um, trained at Middle Temple in, in England um, perhaps because it's yes you know it, it wasn't close to Virginia or um, bo the Boston area so it was kind of didn't really have its own like local source of legal training but yeah, it definitely a lot of interesting like sociological details here, which tells you something about you know there must be something here about you know the character of the judges and and how they thought you know what their kind of intellectual influences were and everything you know they, they a lot of them thought thought the same, but of course when they did think differently those differences mattered. So like I said, the the last part of it is that you know and this is really something that eats me up a lot about Horwitz is that he just loves to throw the results of the case at you. You know, did it was it you know did the did the judges rule in favor of the employee? Well, you know, if if one out of ten times he rules in favor of the worker, clearly the the law is class biased without actually going into the case law and looking at well what were the justifications given on each side? You know, really complicating and humanizing. That's 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 the role that uh, of a scholar, I think, is to really try to, you know, make things more difficult to understand. It's 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 you know adding. Per adding some complexity at the same time try, trying to explain things. So anyway, Vermont political economy. We know the history of Vermont. It came, uh, came out of the struggle of, with New York uh, landed elite for property. Um, the revolution's effect on political institutions, well, Vermont was a, a somewhat radical state in that um, in, in that it, it was, you know, uh, it, the, the state itself was formed uh, in order to, um, you know, be, be against the, the property owners in New York. Um, the legal system, in terms of the legal system, you had typical figures like uh, Moses Robinson, who's on the left there, and on the right we have um, Nathaniel Chipman. Um, so these were two 
figures in, in Vermont law that um, I particularly focus on in, in my dissertation, just to kind of uncover some of their details. Moses Robinson I, I focus on because Robinson was kind of the, 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 the last uh, the last guard of the uh, the, the jurists who were, you know, not d directly trained in law, but still served on, say, the Supreme Court. And they got those positions through family ties, basically. The Robinson family was one of the most wealthy families in Vermont. You know, they were one of the um, uh, leaders in, in the revolution against, against the landed elite and one of the ones who set up the Vermont Constitution. Um, so, you know, part of that Robinson family meant that, you know, you took on a variety of political um, positions in the government and so on. Chipman is part of a, a, a somewhat later period where we do see the first influx of trained lawyers into Vermont. So this happens in the late 1700s. You have Nathaniel Chipman who was actually trained at Litchfield Law School under Tapping Reeve, one of Tapping Reeve's first students. Um, in Connecticut. He actually was born in Connecticut and then he moved up to Vermont and he started a legal um, uh, kind of a little legal circle there um, where he was really one of one of the one of the um, one of the main actors. Um, you know he, he established his law firm one of the only ones in the area. He was able to obviously make quite a good fortune for himself he gained some influence in politics and was appointed to the Supreme Court at various times in the late 1700s and for a period of about five years in the first decade of the 19th century. And um, he wrote a very influential um, political treatise, actually the first American, tri Amer uh, American political treatises, treatise called Sketches of the Principles of Government. It was first published in, I believe, 1793, and then again it was published, uh, a revised version was published in 1833. And in this political treatise, it's really interesting to read through this because, well, first of all, it's, it's, it's the first American one, but also at times you'll find that his politics and his views differ somewhat from what was seen as the mainstream legal profession in, uh, of, say, Jefferson or... Um, or other, uh, or other mainstream um, legal scholars of this period. So you have a positive theory of liberty, for example. Um, you have more of a holistic view of society and an inclusive model of citizenship. He was um, for abolition, for example. And most interestingly, at least for me, is that he supported the establishment of an equity court or a court of chancery. And this is a very interesting historical detail. Um, a court of chancery was, um, it was, it was a court that was to be set up um, separate from a court of law and it was meant to be a little, to emphasize um, different aspects of the law than a standard court of law would. So a court of equity would be involved in um, more of distributive justice. Uh, claims. So if you had a contract that you needed to settle, say, a property contract, um, a, 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 chancery, a, a court of chancery would be involved in settling whether that property contract, that transferral contract, was a fair contract, for example. Um, you know, was it a somewhat equal exchange? Was it a just contract? This focus on distributive justice is very, very unique for this time period. It's, it's not something that mainstream lawyers, say, in Boston or in Virginia would necessarily agree to. And one of the reasons is because if you establish, in addition to a co court of law, if you establish a, a separate court of chancery, well, that means you're giving more powers to the, not only are you giving more powers to the judiciary, but you're giving powers to them that kind of make us feel a little uncertain. If you think about how I just described a court of chancery, you know, it gives a little more discretion to the judges to kind of, you know, weigh the, weigh the merits of a property contract, you know. So they could kind of, you know, d you know, figure out, you know, based on distributive justice, principles of, you know, fairness or, or um, justice and so on, whether a contract was, was, was fair. And so Chipman comes out in favor of this in his sketches of the principles of government, which I find to be a very um, important difference, as we'll see with the mainstream of the legal profession. But even this emphasis on a positive theory of, of, of liberty, I believe, is, is somewhat 
interesting. Um, he has this criticism in, in the sketches early on, um, criticisms of European philosophers. I'm, I'm assuming he's talking about Locke and Hobbes and so on. And he says, you know, these, um, you know, these, he criticizes the European philosophers. He says that, um, you know, you would think from reading these European philosophers that civil government was not so much designed to lead people to happiness as to present, prevent miseries that they might do to each other. So he's, he's criticizing that view that, that law should be about, you know, um, security or pre preventing um, ill morals from people. And instead it should be some kind of affirming, you know, some sense of liberty that, uh, that, that is married to a moral sense. That's important too, that, you know, law should be in, in one with morality and should be, um, you know, law's job should be kind of maintaining the, the communal spirit of society and um, it should be maintaining this positive theory of liberty. So all these tenets, what I'm essentially arguing is that all these tenets point to a more traditional model of social relations and political economy than had existed in mainstream political rhetoric, particularly after the 1800 election with the election of Jefferson. Um, you know, this idea of like a more individualized basis of political economy that I'm just going to explain in a second. Um, so, right, on the Connecticut side we have um, Connecticut is America's Blackstone, wrote the first American treaties in 1796, titled A System of Laws of the State of Connecticut. So Chipman wrote the first political treaties, Swift wrote the first um, legal treaties. And what that means is that he essentially collected all of the laws in the U.S. and tried to get them all down in one book so that judges around the, around the country would have something to refer to when they make their decisions. And the idea was to make this scientific, to make it logical, to explain the common law as it had developed in the US. A very, very significant achievement um, in terms of you know, bringing, modernizing the law and, and making it accessible to judges and really, at the same time, you know, demonstrating how um, massive and complicated, but also how there was some logic underlying um, American law. So in Vermont, you have, um, as I said, these positive theory of liberty, equity, court of chancery. In Connecticut, you have um, Swift, for example, in this legal treatise, out, treatise, outlines a more negative theory of liberty, you know, more in line with the classic European philosophers, as I described, um, as I just described. And also, he opposed a court of chancery. He believed that we shouldn't create a separate court of equity. We should just, you know, try to integrate some equity ideas into law, but don't create a separate court. And Swift was very sure about this, and the reason is because if you, if you create a separate court of equity, you're giving too much power to judges. You're giving too much discretion to judges. You're giving too much power to judges. Now this seems kind of interesting if you think about, you know, what Horwitz was trying to argue, which was that, you know, judges were, you know, all about, you know, asserting themselves and society as social agents and so on. Here we have Swift arguing, well, the way to do it, at least, is not through a court of equity because, um, you know, American judges, um, I don't know if you talked about Mansfield in terms of development of British law, but Mans Mansfield is the, the character that people like Jefferson and some other mainstream um, uh, political figures in the U.S. loved to hammer on. They said, we don't want a Mansfield in America. And what that meant was, you know, Mansfield was very much about, you know, you know legal autonomy, you know, creating his own rules, um, you know, m making everything about, like, or deciding law on his discretion and really building up this, you know, this British law um, in the in the mid 1700s, um, and he said, you know, we can't have a law like that. We can't have a law that's that much at the discretion of judges. We need to have some kind of body, some system of laws that we can refer to that doesn't give judges the power to just you know com go completely off the books. We need to hold them in some ways. And one of the ways to do that is to get rid of this court of chancery, um, this equity court. And it's really a fierce debate, not just um, say between um, Swift and, and Chipman in Connecticut and Vermont, but even in Boston. You have warring um, classes between say Western Massachusetts um, and the Eastern sort of more mainstream body of uh, legal 
uh, of lawyers like Story, for example. Story would um, be against um, um, a court of equity, and, and now I'm actually blinking on the, uh, Sedgwick, Theodore Sedgwick in western Massachusetts, coming from the Connecticut River Valley, much more concerned. I can't say much more conservative, obviously. We're talking about a different period, but more traditional in their understanding of law. Sedgwick was in support of Chancery, for example. So we consider these two frameworks, these two political e economic frameworks. The next question to ask is, well, how does that kind of, how, what kind of law pops out of these political economic frameworks? Um, can we say something about um, the different trajectory of labor employment contract law um, by looking at these by considering these two frameworks as really distinct, as you know, a more nuanced view of um, of legal history. So in Vermont, we really have two main judges that I'm looking at: um, Milo Bennett and Isaac Redfield. Some of you might, well, yeah, if anyone is has 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 read any legal history, you might be familiar with Isaac Redfield, who wrote a couple of treatises on railroads in the in the mid nineteenth century. Um, but Milo L. Bennett is probably much less well known. But Bennett is another Vermont judge, um, and I argue that they had somewhat similar um, similar positions. So the cases that I'm going to be looking at, um, drawing on um, for for the for the rest of this presentation, can really all be kind of considered under one kind of blanket idea of um, right to quit or partial compensation cases sued on quantum merit or some kind of a, a sumset um, action. Um, the idea in its, in its most general form, just so I don't have to go into it each time, is that you have a worker who is working for a, a boss. It might be an entrepreneur. It might be a carpenter. It might be a woodworker. It might be some kind of more entrepreneurial job, or it might be just a straight day laborer type of job, like a hired labor job. And over the course of, say, a six-month co month contract, the worker decides that he's going to leave. He might voluntarily leave a little early, or he might decide that he's going to. Um, you know, or he, or he might, you know, get a little sick, and he needs to, uh, you know, he needs to leave the job for a while. And at times, the employer has a couple options at that point in terms of how to deal with the contract. The employer can either just say at that point, okay, the contract has been breached, we're just going to settle it there. In those cases, um, the contract is said to have been breached, and if you're talking to a specific judge. The judge will say that the worker does not get any compensation, does not get any partial compensation for the time that he worked. So say the worker worked two out of those six months. The worker will not get compensation for those two months on the six-month contract because the contract was said to be entire. It is not said to be divisible. And so because you broke the contract, um, you don't get any compensation for the time that you did work. Now there's a lot of variations on that simple theme. But essentially, they all come down to that. You know, for example, in the case of health, you could say that um, you know a, a, a worker gets sick after two months. You know, should he get compensation at that point? You know, it's it's not like it was his fault for leaving. He didn't voluntarily leave. Um, he just left of his own accord. So in that case, you know, do we give him partial compensation? Well, you know. So you, you might see it as a little more reasonable in that case to give partial compensation, but you know essentially all these cases worked differently, and so that's really the point here is to is to see how they did work. In Gilman and Cole uh, v. Hall, you have a an, an entrepreneur case where builder the builders, which are the plaintiff here, um, Gilman and Cole, contract to build a stone wall. Hall with Hall. Hall refused to pay on the charge of subpar work. So Gilman and Cole essentially didn't do work that was good enough to you know, put a roof on top of the wall. So because you didn't do the work, you or do the work very well, you essentially violated the contract, and you're not um, supposed to get any compensation. And so the question for the law was whether builders could sue on a quantum merit for work performed. In this case, Milo L. Bennett um, agreed and ruled that they could. They could gain some partial compensation for the time that they put in. He cited a, a couple of cases to show this, but his essential point was that um, 
the workers put in some amount of labor into the job, and so they are justified in getting what they put in, essentially. They put in a certain amount, so they're justified in getting it back. They should be compensated for whatever small amount of work that they did. If you know, I promise to deliver a, a barrel of apples and I only deliver half of a barrel, should the, work, should the person who was buying the apples from me still have to pay me for those half a barrel of apples? Well, Bennett ruled on similar grounds there. That, you know, it's about the labor done. It's about the work performed. It's about the fact that this was an act of wealth creation that contributed some amount of product to, um, to the defendant, Hall. And as a result, he should um, have to pay. In Fenton v. Clark, you have a somewhat different position. This was, this was a standard health case. So the worker um, got sick. On grounds of sickness, he, he absented himself. When he tried to get compensation for the time that he did work, again, Clark um, denied compensation, Clark being the employer, saying that, asserting again that the contract was entire. It was not divisible. Um, and so the, the worker cannot gain any um, compensation. Um, so, and again, in this case, Milo Bennett said, well, you know, I don't see any difference between this case, which is, you know, still a case, it's, it's the case of a laborer. I don't see any difference between this case, which is a laborer, and this case, which is an entrepreneur. They both put in work done, and so they should get just, you know, they should, it, it, it's only by the demands of common justice that they should get some partial compensation for the time that they did in, put in. So he were, really wasn't concerned with the fact that uh, Fenton was sick and left. That wasn't a key concern for him. The idea was simply that in both of these cases, they were involved in an act of wealth creation. Now remember, Milo, is, Milo Bennett's taken a somewhat con uh, traditional position on this. So we'll see how you know, maybe it's a little different. It's interesting because, as well because Redfield actually sat on the court for that for that case, for Fenton v. v. Clark. And Redfield actually gave a dissenting opinion in, in Fenton. The opinion that he gave was that, well, the worker, yes, the worker got sick, and so he had to absent himself. Um, but then he should have come back afterwards. There was no reason why the worker should have just left and then never returned. So th the worker had a duty, an obligation, to return to the employer or else he couldn't get the work done, or, or else he couldn't get any partial compensation. So that was Redfield's dissenting opinion. And then you see this really in full force in Redfield's position, Brown v. Kimball, in 1840. <coughs> this idea that the contract was entire, entirety was affirmed in this case. What am I trying to argue? Basically what I'm trying to argue is that in Vermont you had some conflicting decisions based on how employment contracts should be ruled upon, as you can see with these two judges. Bennett offered a more traditional interpretation of the labor contract. In fact, it wasn't even really a contract. It was an agreement to do work, and it was an act of wealth creation, and that should be taken into consideration. Redfield, on the other hand, was much more modern. He was thinking about the rules of the contract. What does the contract say? What is the obligation of the worker to the employer? You know, what are the implicit norms that are, that are involved in a contract when the worker enters into that contract. So those were the kind of things that he was more interested in. So I have a couple of quotes from Bennett. The defendant has full value of Gilman and Cole's labor and principles of common justice require that he should render an equivalent benefit for, um, an equivalent for the benefit received. Whereas we have Redfield, whether the contract was to become absolute for the full time, um, under this state of facts, it is quite impossible for the plaintiff to expect to recover. He was essentially reasoning on, the, on these basis of, of contracts. And then also in Fenton, he was reasoning on the basis of the implied norm in the contract. So when we move on to Connecticut, there are really uh, two main um, cases, Comus v. Lawson, and I'm actually not going to spend too much time just because I want to finish up and leave some time for questions. Um, but uh, but I did want to say something just briefly about um, both of them. You know, they, they were very similar. Um, in, in the first case, Comes uh, v. Lawson, the worker absented himself after six months of work. Um, and the justice in that case, the Connecticut judge, um, 
ruled uh, basically on, on the principles of, of the entirety doctrine. Um, so this is an 1844 case. He's ruling on um, the basis of entirety. You see the same thing in the 1854 case, Dayton v. Dean. Um, again, a, a similar, um, a similar um, a ruling. So, okay, so this is the ruling from, from Connecticut. Where a person has entered into a contract to perform certain service at a stipulated price and has made the performance of the contract in, on his part a condition precedent to his right to recover, he cannot enforce the payment until he has performed the service. So this was a contractarian basis, and this is pretty much the cleanest um, exposition of the entirety uh, of the view of the contract as entire as I could find um, in terms of understanding the labor employment contract. So this entire contract, or this entirety doctrine, was more of a, a modern view of, of the contract. And again, we have in, um, I don't have the name of the case here, um, it's very similar, though. Full performance was a condition pre precedent to the wage being paid. Now what I want to do is I want to compare two similar cases, and this is going to be the last one. The name of the case is Ryan v. Dayton, 25 Connecticut 188. Um, Fenton is very similar to Ryan v. Dayton. Both dealt with a worker who had absented himself due to sickness, and thus it offers a kind of natural experiment. The case was very similar. The worker got sick, left, didn't come back. How did the judges rule in those two cases? How were they different? We already saw what was ruled in Fenton. Bennett, recall, recall that in Fenton v. Clark, Bennett ruled that, well, he doesn't see any difference between this case and the case of an entrepreneur. Both put in some work, they should get the work back that they're due. How did, how did, how did the justice, um, Justice Waits, or sorry, Justice Stores in Connecticut rule? Well, okay, so Vermont, Work courts upheld the workers' right to partial compensation on the grounds of equity and justice. As I said, you know, pr uh, principles of equity, kind of more traditional. Connecticut had earlier on asserted a contractarian framework um, for understanding labor relations. Hired labor, they saw it as hired labor. It's a labor contract, it's, it, it's, it, and that's how we should view it, as a contract. It turns out that Connecticut ruled in favor of the worker as well. So no difference there. I'm not trying to argue that there's some kind of class bias here. But on the grounds of the uniquely status-based concept between the worker and the employer. So basically what, what Justice Storrs argued is that yes, the worker is allowed to recover. And the reason is because the worker-employer relationship is very specific. The worker-employer relationship, employer relationship is one in which um, there needs to be some grounds for considering um, the the, the uh, welfare of the worker, and um, and and it's it's a contract that has some status based to it, and so we need to consider that in the contract. Um, so we see this evolution of Connecticut that is very interesting. You know, starts out with some um, contract basis to a lot of its claims, but then adds this part about, you know, there is some kind of status to the worker as well that we need to consider. Um, the particular relationship that exists between the worker and the employer. It's, it's specific. And the worker cannot necessarily be so easily replaced. So um, when the worker leaves, he, gets, uh, he should have some co partial compensation. Okay, so I should have just put this slide up. I forgot that I had this slide, actually. Uh, since the nature of the contract is one for personal service, the laborer deserves some partial compensation for the time we put in. So this is the main point here. He frames the main issue in terms of the true nature of the contract, the presumed intention of the parties, the demands of justice. Um, but then he asserted his own understanding of the, nature co uh, of the nature of the contract, specifically that the nature of the work done was irreplaceable, not one in which... Um, they might be lawfully performed by the contractor, either personally or by the agency of another. So conclusion, what have we learned from this study? I've kind of already hinted at um, the main contributions here. But we have a development of contract law by the 1850s that clearly had some modern elements based on contract in Connecticut, but also some more traditional arguments. They had ended up ruling in the same way as Vermont on the case involving the health of a worker.
And both elements combine in a somewhat Schumpeterian-like process. Schumpeterian ha Schumpeter, in his um, book Capitalism, Socialism, and, and Democracy, raise your hands if you've read this book, by the way. It's kind of a classic economics book. <laughs> okay, Ronnie. <laughs> okay, you as well. Um, so Schumpeter has this idea in Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy about the steel frame if you remember this. Um, Schumpeter is trying to say that in capitalism, you need the steel frame of the aristocracy to kind of give some stability to capitalism. Um, the aristocracy, traditional norms in general, he talks about the family too, right? The importance of the family in kind of maintaining capitalism because it adds some stability. It, it gives some logic to the accumulation process, for example. Without the family or without the aristocracy to give some political steel frame to, um, to capitalism, capitalism is just going to collapse. And that's really Schumpeter's ultimate thesis, right? Is that capitalism is going to kind of free itself of all of these conservative and traditional feathers and collapse into socialism. And he, and he laments that. Well, and here we see a Schumpeterian-like process because both modern elements of contract but also traditional elements are seeping through in modern law. And, and they're giving some stability to to modern law, which is not necessarily completely permitted in a state of completely free contract. And maybe we can talk about that in the question and answer session. But in five points, here it is. Um, labor law in a modern economy is not entirely based on free contract. We have older forms. We know this in some way. Government has always intervened in social relations. What we didn't know is this composition of the state, this more nuanced view of the state. Who were they? Some of them were more traditional actors. And thus, we see to the extent to which um, ideologies differed and had real impacts on labor relations.